Thank you. The notes will be gathered up by our facilita facilitators and used by for an accountability day, which we are planning for later this year. More details will follow. Uh, before I introduce our final speaker of the day, our First Minister, um, I want to first reflect on the fact that we are only here because of her vision. Our first, first Minister learned about the White House Advisory Council on Women and Girls and took inspiration from it. The First Minister had the vision for her, her Advisory Council to be different though, to be external and engage with Scotland on the matter of gender inequality. So without further ado, I am absolutely delighted to introduce our last speaker of the day, our First Minister. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction and thank you to all of you for being here. There's an incredible energy in this room which I think is hugely encouraging and, and hugely positive. Um, I want to begin uh, my remarks today by saying a heartfelt thank you to all of the Advisory Council members for the absolutely fantastic work that they have done in producing this excellent report. I also want to take the opportunity to thank the many Circle members who have also contributed to this work. Your input has been invaluable, so uh, thank you to all of you. Um, I hope you don't mind if I'm going to make a, a special mention though of Louise MacDonald today who has so expertly chaired the Advisory Council. Louise, as you know, can't be with us today. She's recovering from surgery, but knowing Louise as we all do, I'm pretty sure she's keeping a beady eye on everything that's happening today and will be uh, following what I'm about to say to you very uh, carefully, but uh, I'm sure we all want to send her our love and best wishes for a speedy recovery. We're all looking forward to having her back with us as soon as possible. So thank you uh, to all of you and not just for your work, but for being here at this special event today. You know, in many ways, this venue, uh, the Surgeon's Hall, is an appropriate place for us to be gathering today to talk about this report on gender equality. On your way in here, you might have seen, but if you didn't, you can have a look at it on the way out, a plaque on uh, the outer wall. Uh, and that plaque is dedicated to the UK's first female undergraduate uh, students. In 1869, 150 years ago, the Edinburgh Seven, as they became known, enrolled at the University of Edinburgh to study medicine. And perhaps not surprisingly, they were immediately subject to a campaign of hostility and harassment from staff, students and members of the public. And that culminated uh, here at the Surgeon's Hall in 1870. Uh, the seven women were due to sit an exam in the main building, but when they arrived, they were confronted by hundreds of male students who hurled abuse and threw rubbish at them. Uh, the women, however, persisted and they were eventually able to enter through the gates. Uh, the riot of Surgeon's Hall attracted huge publicity at the time. It galvanised support for the Edinburgh Seven and it won over many people, women and men, uh, to their cause. And as such, it stands uh, all these years later, in my view, as a landmark in Scotland's progress towards equal rights for women. And it is an indication of how far we've come. Uh, last year, women accounted for 60% of entrance uh, to undergraduate courses in Scotland and for medical degrees the figure was slightly higher at 61%. So we can and I think we should take encouragement from the progress that's been made since then. That said, it's clear, very clear on a daily basis uh, that Scotland like so many other countries still has a long way to go in achieving true gender equality. Across every aspect of our society, endemic and often systemic inequalities persist. Uh, and one of the things I pledged when I became First Minister, the first woman to uh, have the privilege of holding this office, 
was that I'd do everything I could to improve opportunities for women and girls. That's a commitment that I take very seriously. It's extremely close to my heart, and it's what the government that I lead has tried to do. We've taken a range of measures to challenge gender stereotypes, help women's voices to be heard, and to tackle violence against women and girls. However, we know that we need to do much more to eradicate the persistent inequalities that many girls and women still face in their daily lives. Uh, that is why I, inspired uh, by the example uh, of Barack Obama when he was in the White House, took the decision to establish the Advisory Council on Women and Girls. And it is why I am so delighted to have received your first uh, year report and recommendations. Um, as I said earlier on, I'm so grateful to everybody who has contributed to this process, uh, members of the council, members of the circle, all those who participated digitally uh, or through the monthly spotlight event. The result of all of that work is, in my view, a report of great insight and huge ambition, and I warmly welcome the report and all of the recommendations in it. Uh, the 11 recommendations are thought-provoking, they are also challenging, and that's exactly what I hoped they would be. When I uh, came to, I think, the first meeting of the Advisory Council, we talked then about the importance of the Council not simply being content to tinker around the edges, but being prepared to be bold and to challenge and really to push the envelope. And I'm delighted in this report that that's exactly what you have done. Now, I don't have time today, obviously, to talk in detail about each of the recommendations. Uh, in any event, the Scottish Government will take the time to consider all of them uh, properly and carefully, and we will publish a full and considered response in due course. But I do want to give you some of my immediate thoughts on the key recommendations. Uh, one of the things that I found very encouraging is that uh, some, not all, but some of the recommendations broadly align with work that the Scottish Government is doing already and will help us to advance and to accelerate that work. Uh, for example, uh, the report focuses rightly on the central importance of education. We're already taking significant action to ensure that our education system promotes gender equality and we will look at how your recommendations can build on those efforts. Similarly, you've uh, proposed improvements to the services we provide to victims of sexual violence and I agree absolutely that that is hugely important. It also ties in with work that uh, the Chief Medical Officer, who's uh, here and indeed a, a member of the Council, is currently taking forward. Your proposal to incorporate into Scots law the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination against women is one that I particularly welcome and I think it is a recommendation that is particularly timely. Um, you will be aware, I think, that in December, another advisory council, the one on human rights uh, leadership, recommended that we embed human rights into a new statutory framework in Scotland. Uh, I strongly support that overall vision and direction of travel and have already announced that we will establish a task force to take that work forward. So work on your proposal uh, can be taken forward as part of that process. Uh, the report also recommends a further expansion of early years learning and childcare. Again, as you know, the Scottish Government is currently in the process of almost doubling the funded childcare entitlement to uh, 1140 hours uh, per year for children. Uh, to put that into context, when we came to office in 2007, the funded entitlement was just of over 400 hours a year. So that is a significant expansion that is already underway. Uh, and that current expansion uh, obviously has significant logistical and financial implications associated with it. So I'm going to be straight with you on this one. Our immediate priority has to be on delivering that commitment. However, as we look to the next parliament, we will carefully consider future investments, whether that's in 
after school care or a further expansion of childcare. And I can confirm to you today that your recommendation will form a central part of that discussion. Our policies on childcare, of course, are just one of the ways in which we've tried to support or are trying to support women in the workplace. Uh, and that's another important issue that the report addresses. For example, through uh, your really uh, interesting proposal for a, a gender beacon collaborative. Uh, the idea of creating such a network to promote equality in the workplace and share best practice across sectors is one that I'm very enthusiastic about and I think it has huge potential. So I can uh, say to you today that the Scottish Government wants to move as quickly as we can to implement that recommendation and will uh, move quickly to explore with partners the best model for achieving uh, that aim. And of course, the Council and the Circle uh, will have a role to play in uh, advising and informing that work as we take it forward. Of course, there are uh, some, inevitably, in a report of uh, this ambition. There are some aspects which we will require to give particularly careful consideration to if we are to do justice uh, to the recommendations. Uh, for example, I'm uh, hugely sympathetic to, indeed uh, hugely supportive of your proposal around electoral candidate quotas uh, and also your proposal around paternity benefits. Uh, however, right now, the powers needed to deliver these proposals are not yet fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament, so we're going to have to give some careful consideration to what we can do within existing powers, and that has to be uh, the starting point, but also, where necessary, uh, make the case for the powers that we would need to do these things, including to the UK Government. And uh, there's no doubt that as we do so, the recommendations and the analysis of the Advisory Council will add real weight to our efforts. Uh, one of your other proposals is for the creation of a new body to review media output. Um, I have to say my initial view here is that this might not necessarily be an appropriate role for government uh, to undertake. Uh, after all, it's vital that we protect the independence of the media uh, and the freedom of the press. That said, the issue underlying this recommendation is a really important one. Uh, the way in which the media portrays women, and indeed on occasion men, is clearly a big factor in shaping harmful gender stereotypes. Now, there have been, uh, and I'll be reasonably tentative here, but there have been some uh, recent positive signs that the media are starting to take this issue more seriously. In December, the Advertising Standards Authority announced a ban on harmful gender stereotyping in advertising. And that's a good example of the media using self-regulation to respond to public concern. And it demonstrates why, as a society, we need to continue to draw attention to and challenge sexism and misogyny and gender harmful gender stereotyping in the media. So we will consider carefully how we can advance the spirit of this recommendation while respecting the independence of the media and the freedom of the press. And I think that illustrates a wider point about all of this. Uh, there's no doubt that the proposals in this report represent a big challenge to the government uh, to build on and accelerate the progress that we've already made. And that's exactly what I asked the Advisory Council to do, and I'm really grateful that you have seized that challenge uh, and risen to that challenge so well. But I think we all agree that government action by itself can't bring about the change that we need to see. Each of us, women and men, individually and collectively, have a responsibility to meet the challenge of tackling gender inequalities. Um, so in setting me a challenge, which I absolutely uh, undertake with real enthusiasm, um, I think it's important that we set each other uh, a challenge. Uh, representatives from across society, from business, education, the public, and the third sectors. Uh, we need to set everybody the same challenge that this report sets for government. Uh, I would ask everybody here, and I would ask all of you to encourage those in your wider networks to read the Advisory Council's recommendations and consider how you, in the networks and spheres in which you operate, can help to achieve the underlying aims of them. Uh, that could involve pushing and agitating for 
greater equality in the organisations that you work in or study in or volunteer in. It could mean looking for new ways to support other women uh, through formal and informal networks, or it could mean seeking new opportunities to advocate for change, not just here in Scotland, but internationally as well. Because the events that took place in Surgeon's Hall uh, 150 years ago might seem like us today to be a historical curiosity. Um, after all, the rights that these seven pioneers fought for back then are ones that today in 2019 the rest of us can largely take for granted because of their courage uh, back then. But the lesson of that, and there are many other examples that could uh, give this same lesson, is that those rights didn't just happen by accident. It required action. It required women and also, crucially, men. I'm a great believer that resolving gender inequalities cannot just be the responsibility of women. It is the responsibility of men uh, as well uh, as women. So it requires uh, brave women and men to show leadership, to take a stand and to persist, sometimes, often, against the odds. And in our different ways, that's the example all of us have to follow if we are to make all aspects of gender inequality before too much longer a historical curiosity. So this report that you have produced uh, will help us to do that. There is no doubt in my mind at all. So I want to conclude by thanking all of you uh, once again for the work and the input, the imagination, the creativity that has produced this report and these recommendations. And I want to thank you uh, for your commitment to a cause that matters so much to all of us, but matters so much to the kind of society we want to live in today and that we want our daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters to inherit uh, as well. So I really look forward to working with all of you in the months and years ahead. You have my personal commitment to take forward these recommendations in a positive spirit and to work together to make sure that they do deliver the kind of change that we want to see and ultimately that they help us to improve the lives of women and girls across Scotland and in the process of doing that, helping to create a truly equal country. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for being straight with us, for your commitments, and I think I can say on behalf of the Council that we are very happy that you, you feel that we've been ambitious and bold, and I remember you saying that to us specifically, so um, we're glad and we're looking forward to the full response and to seeing what happens next. Um, I think you have a couple of time for questions, is that right? Yeah. Um, so I'd like to open the floor up for questions. Um, Amina's got a microphone, she's going to come over to you, and if you could say your name. Um, and tell us your question. Uh, we don't have very long, so it might just be a couple. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm from Girl Guiding Scotland. Thank you for all your enthusiasm in receiving the report. Um, what I would like to know is how will you continue to keep girls and young women at the centre of decision making as you begin to take action on our recommendations? Okay. Well, I think the answer to that question involves many different layers. I mean, I'm determined as, as a woman to make sure that women's voices are heard uh, as loudly as men's are at every level of decision making in our country. That starts with a gender balanced cabinet, which is really important to me, but it goes uh, deeper and wider than that. And it must mean that as we take forward these recommendations, uh, those who have shaped those recommendations, the council, the wider circle, all those who have inputted into this process must be part of taking them forward. I, I don't want anybody who has contributed to this work to think that it's just a case of handing it over and allowing government to do whatever it thinks uh, is best with these. Uh, obviously, government is in the lead here in implementing these recommendations, but it must be a collaborative process. And I would expect, and I'm going to uh, say this to you very openly and, and clearly, I would expect the the council and the circle to hold me and government to account uh, as we take forward these recommendations. And if you don't think we're getting it right, if you don't think we're going far enough, if we don't think we are living up to the spirit of those recommendations, then I would, uh, having got to know uh, the members of the council 
uh, a wee bit over the, the last period, I'm pretty sure you'll speak up and make that views known. So the, the voice of women and girls through the different organisations and networks that you operate in have to be absolutely central to this. A second question? Thank you very much. I'm Lee Chalmers from the Parliament Project. We're a non-partisan organisation working to get more women into politics. And we, wel we welcome the recommendation about quotas and thank you for being straight about what you can do about that. Quotas are not univers universally liked. So what more do you and the government think you could do to um, help parties embrace quotas, to burst some of the myths about quotas? And given the intention to get more women into politics, what more can be done to get the parties to make space for women and to give up power to allow women to come in? Okay. Um, a really important question, both aspects of it. Um, I, I, I think I've said this on public platforms before, so I'm not kind of breaching any confidences. Uh, my party took a lot of persuading uh, that you know, some form of positive action around getting more women into parliament uh, was necessary. I was, as a much younger woman than I am today, involved in lots of debates with my own party and was on the losing side of this. But we continued uh, to, to persuade and to change minds. And uh, my party, uh, belatedly, in my view, but nevertheless better late than never, uh, decided that it had to do something uh, systemic in order to make that jump. Uh, Labour have done the same. They, I think, they did do it before the SNP. We don't both use the same mechanisms. We use different mechanisms, and that is fine. Um, and I think part of how we have to persuade parties who don't currently do that is, is use the evidence. So although my party and Labour uh, do well, perhaps not as well as we should yet, but do better than others on gender representation, the Parliament, Scottish Parliament overall, is held back frankly, by the performance of parties who don't. And I, I don't want to make this a party political point in terms of the colour of all of these parties, uh, but the evidence is there. When you take action, uh, then a difference is made, and when you don't, you can go backwards. So I think we've got to use the evidence. I also think we just have to tackle head-on the, the philosophical arguments against positive action, whether that's through formal quotas or whether that's through other mechanisms that parties might use, and it comes back to this central point. Um, those who oppose that kind of action often do so from the basis of, you know, they support meritocracy. You know, people should be allowed to succeed or not succeed on their own merits. Well, I think we've got to turn that argument on its head. You know, unless you take the view that women are somehow less uh, meritocratic and are less able to be involved in the upper reaches of politics or any other walk of life, then when you've got any organisation that is not broadly gender balanced or representative, that should be the warning sig signal that your organisation is not operating on the basis of meritocracy. Instead, systemic barriers uh, are getting in the way uh, of women progressing. Um, and you know, why do we need to use mechanisms to accelerate the progress? Because frankly, if we leave it to the same ways we've been doing it, for generations now, well, our great, 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 great granddaughters will still be having these discussions, and that would be unconscionable. Um, so I think we've got to take these arguments on. I mean, I've told this story so many times, and it illustrates that point about meritocracy um, perfectly, in, in my view. When I first appointed the Gender Balance Cabinet, I was inundated with letters and emails from men and women. Uh, all saying a variation of the same thing. How do you possibly know all the women in your cabinet are there on merit? I did not get one asking me how I knew all the men were there on merit. So it's that attitude we've got to, to turn on its head. And we owe it, I owe it, as, as the first woman in this post, I owe it to the next generation that we make a significant breakthrough here so that some of these arguments uh, in not too many years to come can be as curious as the Surgeon's Hall story uh, that I told you about is to us today. I think we've got time for one more question. <laughs> Hi there. Um, my name is Debbie Chingua and I'm from Intercultural Youth Scotland. Um, my question is, what's the plan to engage effectively with like multicultural young people without the use of like tokenism, so like having just one um, multicultural person, um, like an ethnic minority in the room full of people who are, you know, 
the major majority of the mm -hmm. ethnic race. Yeah, you know that that has to be, and I, you know, I, I think the the I know the council has. Uh, worked very hard at this and the operation of the, the circle has worked very hard at this that you know we have to hear there is no homogenous women's voice uh, just as there is no homogenous men's voice we have to understand the experiences of all of the different women who make up uh, Scottish uh, womanhood um, and that means hearing the voices of uh, ethnic minority women uh, as loudly as we hear any other voice and I think the first council meeting I attended, I attended for a part of it, the, the whole debate on intersectionality was really an important part of that. So that mustn't be tokenistic, and it means just ensuring uh, in a very systemic way that the, the voices of different uh, uh, communities of women are heard. And you know, I hope that's been the experience uh, for people in, in the circle, particularly, and in the council. Um, if that's not been the experience, I know uh, I'm not can't speak on behalf of Louise, but I'm pretty certain uh, that she would want to reflect on that to make sure that as the council uh, takes on the next phase of its work, uh, then that's something that is addressed. But it is absolutely fundamental uh, to what uh, the advisory council does. Okay, thank you so much. Great questions. Uh, the First Minister now needs to head off somewhere else. Um, but I'd like to thank you once again from all of us for um, your response today to the 2018 report and recommendations. And we're looking forward to the full response soon. Thank you. Thank you all. We hope today has been helpful for you and that our 2018 report and recommendations have done you justice. I wonder if those who attended the September meeting remember Louise MacDonald's final reflections. Do you remember the Truman Show analogy? Truman had the courage to do something different, to break out of his comfort zone, which is coincidentally also exactly what the Advisory Council is all about. The work we're doing here is helping the system to break out of its apparent comfort zone. And like the Truman Show, our aim is that it's going to create a storm. But here's the thing, we're not about bright lightning and being flashy shows of strength. We're aiming to create that long deep rumble of thunder that you feel deep in your bones, causing vibrations that shift things permanently for good. And of course, we're not the only ones trying to create vibrations. There are incredible organisations and people across the country. This is a collective effort. So thanks to each and every one of you and the over 50, 50 members who have signed up to the circle so far. Thank you for your ideas, insight, expertise, curiosity and commitment. Thanks for travelling alongside us. Following this meeting, we'll move on to start exploring our next topic, which is policy coherence. Is all policy made with gender in mind? Another complex topic, but we know with your help, we can explore it and create a positive case for strategic change. In the meantime, please do engage with us online. Set up a Spotlight We Circle with work colleagues, with your friends, family, when you can, and share those outputs with us too. We tweet about this a lot and instructions can be found on our digital platform. Our thanks to the First Minister and to Ellen Renton, Linda, our illustrator, and all of the wonderful volunteer facilitators. We're so grateful for your commitment to the circle. Please do stay and join us for lunch again downstairs and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.